One of my colleagues, this story actually happened to his mother. His mother was speaking to her mother and asking her about her birth. And she explained to her, you were born in a very hard time in Hungary. It was when the winds of war were starting to come. We had heard terrible, terrible rumors about Hitler and what he was doing. But here in, in, in Hungary, where you were born, on that day, I was a young child, and I was just so excited by your birth, I didn't want to think about anything else. We were in the hospital, and I was waiting in my bed for the nurse to bring you to the bed. And finally, she's coming with this bundle of this adorable, adorable child. I couldn't wait to hold you. And I said, come, give her to me already, give her to me. And instead, the nurse just dumps you at the back of the, of the bed and says, these Jewish brats, I don't know why we're even dealing with them. Soon Hitler will destroy them all. And I heard her words, and I just started to cry and cry and cry. But next to me, in the bed next to me, there was a peasant farmer's wife. She was rosy-cheeked, she was an older woman. And she said, oh, don't listen to that witch, she's horrible, don't listen to her. Come, show me your little beautiful daughter. And I showed her to you, to her. And she says, oh, she's so beautiful, what beautiful eyes. And then suddenly her face grew stern. And she says, Mrs., give her to me. You know, I never had any children of my own. And I'll raise her like my own daughter. I promise you, I'll raise her like my own daughter. And I said, I can't give her to you. She's a Jewish child. She needs to be raised like a Jewish child. And she said, oh, she doesn't have a chance. With Hitler coming, she won't have a chance. And she started to reason with me. And I said to her, how do you know that? Throughout all the centuries, they've always tried to come up against us. They've always tried to destroy us. And God was always with us. And at that moment, I remembered that today was Purim. And at that moment, I decided on what your name would be. Later, when your father came that evening and he read the Megillah and he brought me some food, I said to him, I've decided on her name. Her name will be Esther, Esther Hamalka. And your father listened to what I said and he said, oh, it's a good name. It's a good name, it's a good name. God will surely help. And that is how everyone reacted when they heard your name. Esther, Esther Hamalka, it's a good name. God will surely help. God must help. But things grew worse, and we were shepherded into the ghettos. Things there were very difficult. There was very little food. We were under gunpoint. The men were marched out to work every single day. And we lived a frightened existence there. Soon it was time for your third birthday. And your father and I decided that day that we were going to make it special. When he left at gunpoint to go work, I gave him a gold earring that he smuggled out. And he would exchange that with one of the farmers for some flour, sugar, and fruit. And that night, I would make for you special hamantashen. The evening came, and I dressed you. I made for you a special costume. I took a little cardboard, and that became your crown. I took the torn curtain, and that became your gown. And I brushed your hair and brushed it and brushed it until it shone so beautifully. And you were so proud. That night, your father read the Megillah in front of a big crowd, and you, you shone with such a smile. You knew that what was being read was your story. And all the children, every time Esther was named in the Megillah, they would look at you with such respect and such pride. That night you went to sleep stuffed with hamantashen, with the words on your mouth, I'm so lucky that I'm Esther. I'm so happy to be Esther. Esther Hamalka. But that was the last happy day. Things were getting worse and worse and worse. And eventually the time came and we realized it was time where we should be sending you away. We had the opportunity to send you to this small little village, a village that was so forsaken that even the Germans forgot about them. For a sum of money, a peasant, a farmer's wife was agreeable to take you and keep you. The morning came and the man who was going to take you there was waiting for you. He was dressed as a non-Jew, but he was Jewish. 
And I hurriedly prepared your package, prepared your things, and then I said to you, you're going to a place where you'll be able to eat as much bread and as much potatoes as you want, and there won't be any guns around you. And you looked at me and you said, are you and Tati coming? And I said, no, Tati and I are not going to come with you. And then my voice grew stern, and I said to you, listen to me, listen to me carefully. Your name is no longer Esther. From now on, you are Eva. Eva, say it again, Eva, you must know that you are Eva. No one must know about your being a Jewish girl. For whatever it's worth, no matter what, you are never ever to say your Jewish name. Say your name, Eva. And you began to cry. You didn't understand, you were three years old. How were you gonna understand this? And I had no words to comfort you because I knew I too would be crying. But the man, the sweet, gentle man who was going to take you called you over. And he said, Esterka, Esther Amalka, listen to me. I have a story, I wanna tell you something. You're not really leaving your mommy and your tati or your Jewish name. They're really right here in your heart. Every night as you go to sleep, you'll say the Shema and you'll remember your mommy and your tati and you'll remember your Jewish name. But you'll keep it here as a secret. And one day, very soon, your mommy and tati will come and bring you back. You left with him, still crying, but won over with a little candy. Soon after, a long time after, the war was over. Miraculously, your father and I survived the war. And our only thought was, of course, to go find our Estrica, to find our little daughter. The railroads were bombed out. We walked for miles and miles on end until finally we got to the village. And the whole time as we're walking, the one thought that kept penetrating our minds was how many farmers had thrown out their Jewish children, how many had given them over to the Nazis, and how many had decided that they loved their children, these children and just decided to keep them as their own. These were the worries that were going through our minds the entire time, and we prayed and prayed and cried and cried as we walked. And finally, finally, we got to the village where you were. And we looked and we saw, standing outside, this little sunburned girl with matted hair, barefoot, standing and playing in the front yard. And we had decided that we weren't going to tell you immediately who we were, but we would try to win you over, slowly, to sh to, so we shouldn't scare you. And your father said to you, come over here, little girl. And you looked at him with this strange expression in your eyes. You didn't recognize us. And you turned and you ran into the house and you called out, Ma, there's some strange people outside here. Come and see. A moment later, you reappeared with this woman, the peasant, the farmer's wife, holding you so tightly and with her, her arms around yours. And at that moment, I grew so scared. I forgot that we had decided that we were going to slowly get to know you. And I just called out, Esterka, Esther, Esther Hamalka, don't you remember us? Your mommy and your tati? At that second, you froze. There was recognition in your eyes. And suddenly, you just broke away, broke your hand away from the woman, and you ran to us. What prompted her to run over to her parents? Her name, her Jewish identity. You can't hear, I'm sorry. What prompted her to, at that moment, have that recognition? A name is not just a name. A name is a Jewish identity. A home is not just made up of rooms and bricks and walls. The food that we serve is not just a culinary delight that we're going to share with others. Every experience in our life has both a spiritual, a body, and a physical body, and a spiritual component. The body of our lives, the physical aspects of our lives, will over time be forgotten. 
But the spiritual component of our lives, the warmth, the atmosphere, the purpose, the spirituality, the meaning that we imbue into every experience that we share, that is something that will never ever be forgotten. Because that is something that makes us who we are. It becomes very part and parcel of the very fabric of our identity.